Rhonda Roper and Cheryl Brunel. Rhonda serves as Brightview's Vice President of Quality Operations. She has more than 20 years of experience in behavioral health care. She's passionate in supporting quality care for individuals managing addiction and behavioral health needs. And we are very thankful that she's joining us today. The same goes for Krista. Krista Brunel is one of Brightview's certified chemical dependency counselors. She's based in our Akron Center. And she's been in this field for 10 years, which includes her time as a case manager. She was assisting patients with SUDs that lost their children due to their addiction. And with that, I'll let them begin. Thank you. Let's get started today and just take a look at our agenda. Uh, just to answer your question, uh, I'm joining you out of Lexington, Kentucky today and uh, really uh, just thankful to be here to be able to share some of uh, my own experiences and information uh, just to be able to impact any lives uh, that any of you are working with uh, in helping individuals in your families or even uh, individuals you're working with uh, in dealing with uh, addiction in their families. Uh, and also uh, just uh, enjoyed uh, the opportunity to be here with Krista, who uh, is an experienced counselor, uh, definitely a, a subject matter expert. And so, uh, again, just ha happy to be here with you today uh, and share this uh, hopefully helpful information for you. Uh, our agenda today is uh, first we're going to just take a look at family roles in recovery, what those look like. We're going to talk a bit about just the impact of having uh, a parent or uh, an adult child with a substance use disorder. We'll talk through boundaries, what those look like, healthy and unhealthy, uh, some best practices for therapy, uh, ways you can take care uh, of yourselves if you are a caregiver or there are caregivers in your family or caregivers that you're working with. And then we also have some information we wanted to share with you from our patients here at Brightview. And then we'll uh, also answer your questions uh, through Q&A at the end. Uh, and I think now I'm going to hand it off to Krista and she's going to get started. Sure. Hi. Yeah, I'm Krista. I am from Akron, Ohio, uh, Brightview. Uh, we are going to be talking today. Uh, the first topic will be the recent statistics. Uh, these are a little bit old. They do not co cover COVID. I just wanted to mention that because I feel like sometimes the substance abuse uh, gets put on the back burner and it is still uh, active, um, as most of you know, uh, and the overdoses are still very prevalent today. Um, but as you can see from 2015 to 19, 21 million children lived with a parent who used illicit substances. Um, 2 million lived with a parent who had illicit substance use disorder. And 7.5 million children lived with a parent who had alcohol use disorder. With that being said, um, there is an increase in children being removed from their homes due to their parental substance use. I uh, wanted to bring up, um, there are dockets um, through the courts. I don't know what state, I'm hoping they're in every state. I know here in Summit County in Ohio, there is a docket where it is for parents who um, have lost their children due to their use and in their specialized courts. I happen to be on a treatment team through one of those courts. Wanted to just mention that to you if you guys don't have those or if you do have those. A very good court docket that will work with the families to reunify with their children to work with the parents, the caregivers, and the whole family overall to get the children reunified in the home and get the parents the help they need. And through Brightview, uh, we participate in that court as well. Uh, more statistics through 2019, as you can see, almost 40% of children were removed from their home due to the parents' alcohol or other drug abuse. Um, if you look at Ohio, it's not as bad, but if you look at even Kentucky, Illinois, Texas, 60% of the children removed were removed from this from their homes due to the parental use.
Yeah, thanks for sharing some of that those statistics, Krista. I know uh, we've continued you know, to see that increase and in the number of families increase. And uh, as she mentioned, uh, a lot of the newer statistics haven't been released, so we were only able to find that data for you uh, that she just shared. But we certainly know we'll probably continue to see that increase, especially uh, as we continue to see overdoses increase during the COVID epidemic. Uh, just shifting over now to talk about how addiction impacts the family, and we wanted to start first and foremost with just looking at how it affects family roles. Uh, some of the words on the screen may uh, be familiar to you. They're things you've heard before, but let's talk through those just a moment. Uh, so anytime we have an individual in the family who's using substances, uh, Maybe that's apparent in this case. Uh, we tend to see family members really assume certain roles as a way of handling uh, the fact that they're dealing with, you know, that in their family and also just as a way to be helpful. Uh, and one of those roles that we do commonly see is the role of an enabler uh, or a caretaker. So. That person really usually engages in behaviors uh, that can allow the individual to continue their use. Uh, they're not doing that uh, out of, uh, you know, a desire to be, uh, you know, ineffective with their family member. It's just a role that individuals will naturally assume as a way of dealing with the situation. Uh, so that person, if you think about families that you're working with or maybe in your own family, that individual often will be the person who uh, smooth those things over. You know, after the individual in the family who's using, uh, you know, they may have certain behaviors or certain things that they're doing that impacts the family or episodes that occur. And that person, you know, usually will try to uh, clean it up, so to speak. Um, this may also, you know, really occur from that individual sort of taking on a leadership role in their family and really a desire to try to avoid that situation that's happening. Uh, and so uh, an easy way to do that sometimes, uh, again, just a defense mechanism is to really just try to clean things up, uh, to avoid shame, keep more issues from happening, uh, keep others from seeing things that are going on in the family, uh, you know, attempting to sweep it under the rug sometimes. You'll also often see the role of a scapegoat. Uh, that's gonna be the family member who they usually will end up getting blamed for things uh, in the family. Uh, they may also be the individual who uh, they are also dealing with their own, uh, you know, needs or issues. And at times that may end up being a deflection from what's happening with the person in the family who is experiencing addiction. Uh, it's common to see this in uh, the middle child or maybe the second oldest child in the family. There's also the hero. Uh, they attempt to really di fix things in the family, uh, not, not to be confused with the caretaker or the enabler. Uh, the enabler often contributes to behaviors that kind of support the individual continuing to use, uh, whereas the hero typically, they try to fix things. Um, they're the ones usually trying to take care of their siblings. Uh, they may also try to, you know, assume an adult or a leadership role uh, years ahead of them even being an adult, uh, stepping up to try and fix things. And they may also, you know, typically compensate for the shame in the family uh, and, you know, try to cover that up uh, by being the superstar. They're the ones who usually will uh, exhaust themselves trying to uh, deflect from what's happening in the family and, uh, you know, really be the shining star. You'll often see the role of mascot as well. Um, that person uh, has a completely different response usually. Uh, they may try to just make light of the situation, uh, more or less, uh, you know, trying to uh, make the situation seem not as bad as it is. Uh, they may deflect from the situation uh, or just typically, you know, bury what's even happening or not even acknowledge it in some cases. Uh, this role is typically seen in the youngest child, uh, but again, could happen, you know, in, in various, uh, uh, you know, individuals in the family. And then there's also the lost child. Uh, that person usually struggles uh, with the situation, uh, you know, not that all the others aren't as well, but they typically struggle in a way that uh, they shut down. Uh, they may have trouble making decisions. Uh, they may just isolate uh, from the rest of the family. Uh, and usually their, their relationships are severely impacted. Uh, 
they lose the ability to trust, uh, just not sure how to deal with the situation. And so more or less, they might close off, uh, you know, from others as a way of coping with that situation. So just some of the typical roles there for you to think about. And uh, if you're dealing with addiction in your family, it can be helpful to think about how those roles may be filled in your family as a way to help with just problem solving. And we'll talk about some of that in more detail in just a bit. Uh, and I think, Krista, I'm going to hand it off to you now uh, for some additional information on just the impact on the family. Thank you, Rhonda. So uh, addiction in the family it, it contributes to a higher risk of all forms of abuse, emotional, physical, or sexual. Um, it affects the family dynamic legally, um, medically, academically, physically, and fiscally. There are problems with communication, not knowing how to speak to or deal with the addict, high levels of conflict as those in addiction are not going to admit it. Um, they're going to want to argue with you. There are a lot of chaos and disorganization in the family, breakdown of your family rituals, the boundaries, um, family members, as Rhonda stated, wanting to cover up for the family member, not discuss this, uh, the shame that comes with it, um, increased risk of sealing. Uh, from family, work, or others to sustain their habits. Uh, overall, the work, life, family balance is interrupted daily. And then there could be also involvement of child protective services. Next slide. Uh, common characteristics of the families with the SUD. So there is the substance use disorder, um, family dysfunction, conflict, stress, and then possible relapse. And the circle just goes in around and around. Um, active family characteristics is the family has to organize around managing the person that has the substance use disorder. Again, the shame, hiding it, not wanting to discuss it, um, and all those roles of the family members that Rhonda had addressed previously. Um, sometimes holidays, any family functions are disrupted. You don't know how the person with the substance use disorder is going to act should they be invited. Should you even go? Um, alcohol or drug use becomes the family's way to cope with stress and there is low expectation of the children's successes, which goes into the generational use of uh, SUDs and how do you help get past that and end that generational use. And then there's fear. Um, each family member knows that something is very wrong in the family. They don't know how to address it. They don't know what first steps to take. So we wanna go move on to healthy families where the family members contribute, they're engaged. Let's do a good tradition mean, and still maintain the family traditions. Don't be afraid to continue on with your life just because someone does have the SUD. You still have to remember everyone else in the family um, who is affected by this too and try not to disrupt their lives too much. Um, set clear expectations healthy family values, um, where the use of alcohol or drugs is clearly discussed. Uh, children are encouraged to do their best with reasonable, reasonable expectations of success. And then family members are positive, hopeful, and they have good expectations that things will be all right and that they will be safe in the family. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, Rhonda, is, I believe this is you. I'm handing it back to you. Sorry. Yeah, I'll take this one. Uh, and thanks for just shedding some light on kind of the differences there between uh, families dealing with addiction and families, uh, you know, that are not. That certainly helps uh, see see the differences there. 
Uh, let's look at the gender, you know, specific differences. Uh, addiction in the family can look very different for men compared to women. Uh, and uh, obviously treat, treating addiction or how addiction is playing out for that individual can also be uh, dif different based on uh, whether they're male or female. And so for men, uh, what we typically see uh, is that they have a higher risk of early uh, and late onset substance use compared to women. Uh, whereas women, they may progress from initiating the substance use faster than men, uh, especially with substances like alcohol, cannabis, or opiates. Um, so uh, important you know, to think about that, whereas men uh, may have a higher risk, uh, women can ramp up their substance use much faster uh, in those particular substances. Thinking about stabilization and what that looks like for men, they tend to stabilize at a slower rate, uh, whereas women typically uh, will fall apart quicker and have more extreme uh, periods of relapse or periods of falling out of recovery. And sometimes that can just be related to uh, different roles women are playing, you know, sp especially motherhood uh, and parenting responsibilities can really impact there. For men, uh, there is a higher prevalence of substance use compared to women. Uh, and then the consequences uh, can look a little bit different uh, as we talked about, you know, for men compared to women. Uh, Speaking further on the parenting, uh, you know, situation for women, uh, women typically are impacted from the consequences at a higher rate uh, as, uh, you know, related to things like child protective services uh, or even, you know, pregnant women once they give birth uh, and uh, they may, uh, you know, have an open case or even at times lose uh, custody of their children. Women also tend to see uh, just uh, more severe overall consequences uh, compared to men just in regards to the family functioning. And a lot of that's just from the assumed role as the family caregiver uh, and the role they play again in parenting and motherhood. Women also tend to experience treatment barriers related to those same things. Uh, child care can be an enormous uh, barrier uh, to treatment and to uh, continued ongoing participation in treatment. And uh, of, of course, financial support as well, uh, again, impacted from that uh, caregiving responsibility role, especially uh, in that if you uh, have young children or children that are not in school, employment can be impacted uh, just due to that lack of child care uh, for children. Uh, we see that a lot in patients that we're treating uh, here at uh, Brightview for sure. And then when we think about adolescents, um, they also can have differences just based on their genders as well, uh, based on uh, initiation of treatment and then just ongoing participation in treatment. So things like, uh, you know, their personality characteristics uh, also can really impact uh, their likelihood to engage in treatment services and then also what their addiction may look like. Um, but generally, there are some similarities for adolescents just in the same way that we looked at there for adults, for men and women. Next slide. Yeah, and now shifting to just talking through what it looks like living uh, with a parent, uh, one or two parents even, who have a substance use disorder. Uh, Krista talked through how that really can impact the family and uh, what a healthy family uh, looks like compared to one with addiction. So uh, when we think about the impact, we definitely want to look at the physical and environmental impact. One of the things that we often see for children uh, is just their personal care is usually uh, likely to be impacted if they're living in a home where addiction is occurring. They may come into school or go to childcare, or you may just see them out and about. Uh, they may not be, uh, you know, clean or bathed. Uh, their hygiene is poor, and so that can be one red flag. They also may also, you know, often see uh, just basic resources not being in place. Uh, things like having lunch money, school supplies, uh, whether appropriate clothing is something uh, that we often see as well. And then a lack of uh, just care related to their health, vaccinations, uh, dental care. Uh, again, all those basic needs can be impacted because the focus in the family is on the addiction and losing track of those physical and environmental impacts uh, really does typically happen with addiction. 
Obviously, attendance is uh, typically impacted as well. Uh, children in homes with addiction may uh, be tardy or uh, have lots of absences just related to that. Uh, and at times, there may also be a lack of oversight to even make sure that the child is attending school, you know, as scheduled or as required. Nutrition uh, impacted uh, just from the fact that uh, kids in these homes may not be getting uh, healthy foods. They may not be getting enough foods. Uh, they may be eating a lot of snacks uh, or just whatever they're able to get by joining other friends uh, or even depending on their school meals to be some of their main sources of nutrition during the day. Uh, really want to point that out because that is something that uh, often has been seen uh, just in my experience with kids that are impacted in this way. Lack of supervision, uh, very common uh, kids uh, engaging in activities or things, uh, you know, that are not safe, uh, a lack of oversight. Uh, it's not uncommon for kids in homes, you know, dealing with addiction to just not have the oversight, uh, no one watching them, so to speak. And so, they're just living, uh, you know, at their own whim and at their own wills of whatever they're they're wanting to do. And uh, that may look very different just depending on the age of the child. And then lastly, uh, we talked about those roles in uh, the family. And so, again, not uncommon to see children in these homes really taking on a lot of extra responsibilities. Uh, they may be taking care of their siblings. They may be the ones sometimes in schools. Uh, I've seen this where they're not able to, teachers aren't able to get through to the parents, and so they're sending word through an older sibling or through another sibling uh, because that person always gets the note, you know, back to the family or the, the permission slip sign, you know, whatever it is. So those are just some of the things to think about in regards to that physical and environmental impact on uh, the children. Next slide. And just the same, uh, you know, physical and environmental impacts occur and as well, uh, behavioral and emotional uh, impacts as well. And so uh, decline in school performance, uh, that one can really be uh, an important red flag to think about. Uh, oftentimes, if kids have been very successful in school, uh, whether that be either classroom work or sports or any extracurricular activities, and you start to see a decline in their performance, usually can be a signal that something's going on in the home. And so important to just think about the fact that substance use may be something to think about there. Negative behavior in school, uh, quite common as well. And then uh, seeing different behaviors playing out with kids. Uh, there may be acts of rebellion. Uh, just as we looked at those different family roles, some kids uh, on the flip, rather than acting out and rebelling, they may just hold everything in and uh, you may not see as much of that. You may see isolation or withdrawal, uh, being disconnected from others, disconnected from their classmates, uh, or even uh, you know just uh, not wanting to be around others. And then, of course, mood swings uh, and behaviors around acting out, uh, not showing empathy or remorse or anger can be quite common uh, to see as well. Next slide. And then uh, overall, we do see just an impact on home life in general uh, in some of those ways that Krista just reviewed previously. But uh, most importantly, financial strain uh, on the family is quite common to see loss of income, uh, job stability, hopping around to different jobs. Uh, I'd even add in here uh, seeing kids, you know, moving around to different schools can be quite common because families may be experiencing this financial strain, losing jobs, uh, you know, not having the ability to pay their rent, moving to different places, uh, trying to start fresh again uh, can be quite common. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, neglecting work, uh, but parenting responsibilities as well. Um, and I'll say this, uh, you know, individuals dealing with uh, addiction, uh, you know, have a lot that they're dealing with. And so uh, oftentimes you may see them uh, focusing on these things, but it may be intermittently. Uh, things may get better for a while and then they may, uh, you know, you may see these things ramp up or see things sort of fall apart quickly. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, there can be just a lost uh, loss of trust between 
uh, the individual that is, uh, you know, in the home with the person that's uh, dealing with addiction. So whether that's a spouse or, or even children, uh, you can often see them uh, losing the ability to depend on this person uh, because of the addiction that they're dealing with. Next slide. And then just some additional things to point out here around, uh, you know, just how this impacts the family. Uh, I spoke to this a moment ago, but just to reiterate it a bit further, uh, the child and parent relationship uh, is already one that can be quite unpredictable. Uh, you know, any of you here that have kids, uh, we can say that, uh, you know, it's it can be a roller coaster. And so uh, adding addiction in there certainly does not make things any easier. Uh, the cycle of use can really impact uh, the family in general, and uh, there may be times when things are getting better, but uh, the length of time that that's occurring uh, is unknown. It may be that the person stabilizes for a few days, it could be a few weeks or a few months, and so uh, that roller coaster is really a good uh, analogy there to think about uh, just from the fact that addiction can be very unpredictable. Also, children, uh, you know, may grow up too fast. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the different roles. And so uh, those kids that you're seeing may be uh, well beyond their years with some of the responsibilities that they're taking on or even missing out on uh, child related activities or even not having interest in those child activities because they're so focused on trying to do those things at home, take care of their parent, uh, take care of their sibling, clean up the house, make sure there's dinner, whatever the case may be. And then I'll uh, just point out here as well, uh, the stigma and embarrassment that kids or family members are experiencing. Um, you know, it is more common than not to have someone in our families now who are dealing with addiction, uh, but just the same, that doesn't mean that the stigma is still not uh, throughout our world, and there is still a high level of shame with that because uh, not everyone in our communities are educated about addiction and uh, what that recovery process can look like or even what that process uh, of addiction looks like. And so uh, certainly just want to point out there that the stigma and embarrassing, embarrassment can be uh, really uh, you know, difficult for individuals for sure. And then last but not least, uh, just thinking about, uh, you know, the adult role in the family. Important to note here, you know, uh, we usually think of our parents as people that we can trust and depend on. And so if you just think about the context of what it's like for kids living, uh, you know, in uh, these types of homes, they really uh, miss out on that opportunity oftentimes uh, because of the instability that may be happening with that person uh, and have difficulty just bonding and relating to adults in general uh, because they've not been able to build that trusting relationship uh, or have that dependable person that they can always go to. Next slide. And then just looking a little bit at just the diverse needs of children uh, whose parents are, are using substances. Um, one thing that uh, can often be forgotten is just the fact that, uh, you know, these children have not had the opportunity to even express what they're dealing with in the home. Uh, they may be so used to the fact that that's just how it's always been that they may not always have awareness that things uh, could be different or are different uh, for others out there. And so, uh, you know, that is something I think to really uh, just keep in mind that it's not always known by the children uh, what they're missing out on at times. It's also important to make sure we're, we're offering just age appropriate information to children in general about substance use and mental health disorders. Um, and I'll take that a step further and say uh, any family member, right? Even if they're not children, uh, helping as many adults as we can understand uh, what substance use and mental health uh, disorders can look like uh, for individuals and look like in families as well. 
And then for kids that are dealing with uh, with addiction in their home, they may often experience developmental delays uh, just from the standpoint that they have not been uh, able to get the supports that they need, uh, you know, in uh, infancy or even in toddler years, early childhood years. And so that can lead to some developmental delay issues. Uh, it may also mean that they have uh, co-occurring or additional medical conditions or even mental health conditions uh, that have not been uh, recognized or treated uh, or even substance use disorders of their own. Um, when we see addiction in the family, it is more common for us to see uh, children be more likely to use substances and to start doing so at a younger age. Um, so very important to think about uh, the impact that that can have and always uh, rule that out as a possibility. And then being able to link uh, these individuals up with counseling or peer support groups. Um, and so, you know, in school settings, I've started to see, uh, you know, options available for kids to be able to be in after school groups, uh, you know, with other kids that may be experiencing some similar things in their homes. Uh, just the same for adults, right? Uh, if you're an adult and you're uh, dealing with addiction in your family, being able to connect to others who are experiencing the same thing, here's some stories of how they have been able to cope and deal with those situations can be so empowering um, and be a great place for connection. And then lastly there, uh, just consistent and ongoing support is so uh, important for us to think about when we're looking at the impact on uh, children in ways that we can help. Um, we want to make sure that we're linking them up with resources um, and, uh, you know, at times it may be adding additional caregivers in the family who are able to help keep them safe. Uh, while their parent recovers. And so uh, that's one of the ways, uh, you know, we've seen individuals really be able to manage their addiction is having those family members step in and help with their children during those times where they're trying to get help and get treatment. Next slide. Krista, I think I'll hand this one off to you now. So one of the tools that is used um, when we are speaking with someone in substance use or uh, um, mental health use is the uh, ACEs and it is adverse childhood experiences. And this is based on children uh, who then turn into adults um, growing up in a home with exposure to these traumatic childhood experiences. And this is associated with the lifelong physical, emotional, psychological, and the social challenges. So uh, for each question, there is one point given for the type of trauma. You want a score of zero. Um, those who have five or more or seven, five or more points were seven to 10 times more likely to have um, problems with substance use, whether it's addiction, um, through IV use and two times more likely to misuse alcohol. Uh, people don't, as an adult, thinking back on this, um, this is a very good tool because that you can think back and realize that there was substance use, there was dysfunction. Um, there may have been mental illness or, you know, someone may have been incarcerated. So that um kind of gives the family members you know hey all this happened in the home and we need to address all of this as as the adult you know so that maybe they will not turn to um drugs or alcohol or maybe to even t help the addict understand you know why that they didn't have control over a lot of these situations that were happening in their home as they were growing up next slide and then we have the positive childhood experiences, um, promoting safe, stable, and nurturing relationships in the environments um, include feeling safe, supported at home, sense of belonging and security. They had trusted adults in their life, trusted family members, uh, and the <clears throat> sense of belonging, connectedness, and building resilience in the family. And these positive childhood experiences can maybe buffer some of the adverse childhood experiences that the children had growing up. 
Next slide. Uh, the impact of having an adult child with substance use disorder. Um, the interaction between the parent and the adult child is usually led, unfortunately, by the adult child's destructive drug use. It can include um, negatives of financial abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse um, of a parent from the adult child. Uh, parents often try to explain and justify the adult child's disruptive behavior instead of, well, I guess instead of talking about it. Um, sober person that the parent likes, you make an effort for that sober person. This is where the enabling comes in and the uh, roles that Rhonda had mentioned earlier. The fact that the external factor, which is the drugs, um, blames, it makes it easier to repair the parent-child parent bond, where you can blame, while well, the child is just using, they're just, you know, they just have substance use, that's why they're acting this way, and that's, the drugs are often blamed. Uh, the adult child who is under the influence is, at times, very aggressive and self-destructive. The single most important factor in improving the parent situation with the adult child who has the substance use is to find a way for their adult child to live their life sober. Uh, that's very hard. Um, as we all know, the a, a person in addiction has to want the help, and this could take many times of trying to get them into sober supports, trying to get them into treatment, whether it's outpatient, whether it's residential. And this can take years of trying to get them sober. It could take many relapses. It could take, um, like I said, years. Um, personal experience uh, that I have, my, both of my children um, have SUDs and it's five times took my, <laughs> oldest and right now he is sober, but it's just an ongoing uh, battle to get them ready to fi find the time when they are ready and they are willing to go and get the help that they need. Uh, next slide. Living with the adult child in recovery. So when that child is right um, and is ready and you guys, the whole family has agreed, um, Recovery and aftercare plans are encouraged, shared with loved ones who are going to be there to support them with this. And you need to ask the person with the substance use problem um, sh to share. What is your plan for relapse? What about your meetings? What about your appointments that you're going to? How can, your, our, how can we help you? How can your loved ones help you get through this? What do you need from us? Um, parents, help with the relapse plan, help with the meetings, but don't overstep your boundaries. Um, you have to have firm boundaries in place while your child is going through this or the adult is going through this. Um, you can help them with childcare. You can go to meetings with them, take them to the meetings. Um, make sure that you are in your own therapy and if needed, there should be family counseling as well. But you ask them, how can we help you? How can we support you? What do you need from us? Um, often, because family members are they're unaware that they may have been enabling their loved ones, they didn't know how to help their loved ones. So always asking the person in recovery, you know, what can we do to help you? Next slide. And again, um, ask what can we do differently? What worked for you in the past? What has not worked? How can we change this? Um, the expectations and boundaries should always be communicated um, between the parents and the child. Um, emphasize the fact that, you know, there will be boundaries put in place, but your home is safe for sobriety. Your continued progress um, 
you know, we're going to be there to support you with it. But there will be the ground rules and there will be boundaries put in place. Some parents have even written a contract, uh, house rules. There will be no using in the house. You know, you, you cannot use my car right now. I cannot give you any money. Um, and sometimes the child has signed it. Um, recognizing that you don't want to have high hopes. You don't want to, oh, they're, they're out, they're doing great, we have a relapse plan in place, they're going to meetings, and everything is going to be perfect now. Uh, as a parent, you don't want to have those high hopes, because if they get knocked down, it's it can be devastating. But um, always have Narcan, know how to use it. There are videos on the internet that you can look up. Uh, Narcan is free. You can use your yolk contact your local health department and they will mail it out to you. Um, if needed, some parents lock up your medicines, dispose of your unused prescriptions, uh, respect the addict in recovery's privacy, but you also have to ask for that same respect in return for yourself. And for yourself, have a plan in place if there is a relapse, how you are going to handle that both emotionally and and mentally so that you can like take care of yourself as well as the child. Next slide. Uh, how does the SUD affect spouses and the significant others? Um, in the marriage, there's resentment, constant conflict, finances, parental tasks, who's working, are you able to hold the job? Um, there's emotional detachment, which can happen quickly. Unfortunately, um, abuses, physical, or emotional, um, sexual, there is financial, legal, and the custody problems. Um, CSB may get involved. One parent is, you know, has the SUD, the other one does not. The one who doesn't gets the kids. And then the one who does, you know, it's it's devastating as they feel like a failure. Um, maybe there is no chance of the marriage being saved. Um, high risk of violence and mistreatment and resentment between the one who does have the SUD and the one who doesn't. Um, relatively common reasons for divorce um, because of the SUD. Um, as you can see, it's the third most common reason for women and the eighth most common reason for men. Uh, one thing I do want you to take away from this is that it is an illness. Addiction is an illness. Um, it's not something that just, oh, I think I'll go ahead and just maybe start using a substance today just to be spiteful or just because I'm mad at my spouse, my partner. Um, it is an illness. So... Um, if we look at the bottom here, uh, the codependent spouse acts out of fear, habit, or even pity. They may want to help their spouse, but they don't know how to. They're enabling them, covering up for them, and that's doing more bad than good. It's hurting the relationship and the family. Um, consequences of using is too much of a price to pay. And they want to keep the peace and continue permitting the habit is the codependent part. Next slide, which I think is handing over to you, Rhonda. Yeah, I think I'll take Thank this you. one. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks for talking through that. I think uh, that's a good lead in to just helping us see some ways that we can support a loved one through relapse. And so just to echo what Krista said, um, a substance use disorder is a relapsing brain disease. It's an illness, um, and uh, it is something that requires ongoing uh, treatment and support. Uh, it may be that a person is uh, able to go into treatment, uh, you know, get sober, recover, um, but not every person is going to do that once and that lasts forever. Uh, relapse is uh, a common part of the recovery journey. And so I would encourage you just to think about that around, uh, you know, other uh, health-related illnesses, uh, you know, diabetes. Uh, it takes ongoing, uh, you know, lifestyle changes and supports uh, to 
um, you know, help that person be successful. Uh, so just the same, uh, thinking about addiction in that way can help really uh, understand what that person is going through that's dealing with addiction uh, in their life. And so uh, just depending on your loved one's stage of readiness. And so what stage of readiness means is just where they're at in the change process. Um, change is a process. It takes time. And uh, these are the different stages of change that are listed here. And so uh, pre-contemplation is uh, the stage a person is in. Uh, where they're just, you know, thinking uh, about the fact that they might have a problem. Um, they're not even sure that they do, right? Maybe you're telling them over and over that you see it and they do. Maybe they've been arrested a few times. Maybe they've lost their children. Uh, you know, maybe they've moved out and they're staying somewhere else. You know, uh, lots of extremes have occurred. But they may still not fully be to the point where they really are in full understanding of what impact that's having on their life and what stage they're in. And so in pre-contemplation, that's a really touchy place for that person to be in. So uh, if they're in that stage, you want to just express your love, your concern, and your desire to see them, uh, you know, live a better life, um, listen to them, empathize with them, um, and just being there to listen and support them through that stage is really important. Um, anytime we're thinking about changing something in our lives, we start there, believe it or not. And so, uh, you know, that's really the first step. Contemplation is just a little step further. You know, when we're contemplating something, rather than it being just a fleeting thought, contemplation means it's starting to kind of be in our minds. We're thinking about it more often. Hey, you know, what everybody's telling me about the problems I'm having, they might be right. There might be some, you know, validity to that. Um, and so that person's a little bit more likely to do something about their problem. Uh, at that stage, if your family member's there, you want to express just confidence in their ability. You might hear them say things like, I'd like to go start, you know, treatment at XYZ, but I just don't know how I would do that and still work every day. And so when you hear people saying things like that, that means they're contemplating the fact that they have a problem and they're starting to think about how would it look if I did try to do something about this. Um, so as a family member, expressing confidence in their ability to make the change, talking with them about those pros and cons, um, how to work through those barriers that might be there. That's the most important thing that you can do. And then also doing that with the expectation that it may take them, just like Krista said, several days, several weeks, several months, or even years sometimes before they actually go enroll in that program or actually go to that meeting. Um, and so just continuing to offer that support, building their confidence is the best thing that you can do. And then preparation. Uh, when the person's in that stage, They've really accepted uh, the fact that they're feeling like they have a problem. Uh, things in their life become chaotic and they want to create a plan and do something about it. So your biggest uh, source of support during that preparation stage for your family member is offer ways to help. When you hear them saying, I'm ready to get a plan in place. I want to go get into treatment. Um, I'm ready to do that. Help them do that right then. Uh, don't delay, um, set up a plan, support them in getting there, help them find treatment options, uh, help them figure out the payment process. Um, we talked about, you know, child care and transportation. Those are two of the biggest barriers. Um, help them figure out what they can do. Uh, even if it's just a short-term plan, it can get them into that treatment support that they need. And then that support can help, you know, continue that forward. And action, that's the part where, uh, you know, the individual really begins to carry out the plan. And uh, like I said, during that time, that individual may start their recovery journey and it may not go completely upward. There may be some bumps in the road. There may be some things that, uh, you know, happen with them or some realizations that are difficult. Uh, relapse can happen during that time period. So continue to help support them, praise them, help them see the things that they're doing well, the positive changes they've made, and offer a moral support. 
And again, just avoiding blaming, shaming, getting aggressive, listening and providing support are two of the best things that you can do uh, for that individual. And uh, just some phrases there that are helpful that I'll point out off that slide. Uh, I am here to support you. This doesn't mean you have failed. I know your intent is to remain sober. Reminding them of why they started that journey, right? Um, it was a hang up, something's happened, but let's get back on track and get through this. Um, and then how has this experience provided insight? You know, we learn something from every experience that happens. And so, um, hey, that happened and that was really crummy, but what do we know now that that happened, right? How can that help us? Um, and then how can you help them uh, get there to where they're going right now? Next slide. And then boundaries, uh, such an important topic, uh, you know, in uh, this presentation, boundaries are difficult when uh, we're dealing with addiction in our family. And so uh, we thought our best source of information there would be just to provide you with some information from our own patients. Uh, and so uh, we ask uh, several staff members who are in recovery and we have some uh, of their uh, wisdom as well. And so what are your thoughts on your loved ones uh, having to set boundaries for you while you were in active addiction? And uh, one of our staff members said, uh, someone has to be willing to stop the enabling of the person living in addiction. Boundaries are some of the hardest things to set, but some of the most critical in seeing change lives. We need to learn to set boundaries for ourselves and respect those set by others. And boundaries can really uh, just be doing something once and trying to set that boundary one time and see what happens. That's one of the biggest first steps that you can take. And then lastly here, healthy boundaries allow distance from toxic relationships and situations, uh, and they allow family members time to heal and better understand the recovery journey. Uh, I found this saying true. I must remember that I shouldn't expect instantaneous acceptance of my being sober, right? And so take away there, that person may have to prove themselves some, you know, uh, it may be that that trust is lost that we talked about. And then Krista, I think you're gonna share just a little more wisdom on boundaries. Sure. So uh, why is setting boundaries so important? Um, at Brightview, we empower and encourage individuals in recovery to become part of our team. These again were from the quotes that were from our staff members, um, the outreach. Um, did anything work for you? Or did you wish your loved ones did something differently? Uh, this is it, first step to setting up a boundary. Um, she says that her mother made the decision to stop having alcohol in her home. So maybe this person had uh, alcohol use. So the first step um, in the boundaries with with her was how not having the alcohol and it made her angry. Uh, people in active addiction want things their way all the time. In hindsight, it changes such it's changes such as these that ultimately saved my life. Second member uh, staff member says my parents knew from experience. No, no matter how much they knew I needed help, it didn't matter until I was ready. They put very strict boundaries in place immediately from a strict visitation schedule. Uh, they must uh, have custody of her children to absolutely zero financial help until I was making better decisions and moving in the right direction. So uh, the boundaries main thing is you put the boundaries in place for yourself um, for they for those um, with SUD, but also for yourself to try to stick to those boundaries. And as Rhonda said, try one boundary once, see if it works. And if it doesn't try something else. Next slide. Uh, enabling versus loving. Um, I did see a question that was asked. Uh, how can you still love a child um, while enabling them? Or um, the difference is enabling is um, hmm. You, where the family member will engage in behaviors that, although you feel that they're helping the person with the SUD, they are not. You're helping them um, maintain it. Um, 
and not moving them forward, um, possibly because you just don't know how to help them or you don't know what to say or what to do. So um, you keep the person, you know, with the SUD from experiencing the negative effects. So going to make sure that, you know, they have money, making sure that you pick them up, making sure, you know, no, they are, there's nothing negative about them. I'm, I'm going to cover it up um, and make it easier for them to continue to um, use their unsafe habits. Um, it gives them a reason so that they don't have to go to treatment. I'm okay. You know, mom and dad are fine. You know, they understand that I use a little bit and they're okay with it. Um, the parents of an adult son who misuses the prescription opioids might continue to give him money, let him live at home, bail him out of jail, you know, and that enable them. Um, but again, because we clearly love our children, we don't want to see him suffer. We don't want to see him hurt. You feel like you're doing the right thing by supporting him. Um, enabling is common. It's a normal reaction um, among family members. You don't even realize that you're doing it. Uh, do not shame, blame, or lecture family members who are enabling substance use related behaviors. Uh, instead, gently offer education. You know, let them know that they're enabling. They may, may not even know. And even though they are well, in, well intended, you're actually uh, harming the person with the FU, SUD um, and working against that person's recovery. Uh, help the family members come up with more adaptive ways to support the individual, but not support the substance misuse. Next slide. Uh, as a family member, what can you do? Educate yourself. Um, if you have good supports, your family is supportive, you're educated on SUD, uh, relapse, maintaining sobriety, the person with the SUD is more likely to stay sober. So educate yourself. Show that you care. Um, coming from a place of empathy and compassion um, instead of judging and enabling. Um, like right here, it says um, empathy and compassion instead of, you know, making them feel judged or condemned because they had the substance use. Um, educate yourself. Uh, teach how addiction works. Go to counseling yourself if you need it. Take the family and be open to the idea that addiction is a disease and speak to the right people in the field. Um, medical counselors, um, yeah, who, whoever you need to, to speak with. And then again, the boundaries, they do save lives. Uh, staff member in Kentucky said, um, we didn't have an understanding of what the personal boundaries were and you mistook it um, as a personal offense against us. But it's not the person, it's the disease. And I wish those that had loved me had set the boundaries sooner. So I think you set the boundaries. Uh, the people will, person with an SUD is going to be very upset with you at first, but then they're going to realize, you know what, those boundaries actually did help save my life. And with Rhonda, or with that, that Rhonda, next is you. Yeah, yeah. And so just some things uh, as a treatment provider, if you're joining us today as a provider of treatment, some things you can do uh, is, uh, you know, safety planning with the individual and then treatment for the parents. Uh, uh, you know, and the children, right? The children that are in these homes that are impacted by addiction in this way, they likely need uh, some supports themselves. And so counseling services can be really helpful for them just the same. Um, and then family-based treatment goals are helpful, uh, you know, in these situations as well. And uh, we talked about peer, peer support groups or groups where, uh, you know, children can engage with others who are dealing with similar uh, things in their homes as well. Uh, making referrals. Uh, one of the things Krista just mentioned is, uh, you know, getting uh, education about substance use. And so uh, never forget, it's so important to seek out individuals with expertise and knowledge who have experience in treating these conditions. Um, 
they're they are able to help people and do it each and every day. Uh, we are joining you in this meeting today to say that we see people recovering here each and every day, and they've all come to us from similar journeys and recovery is possible. And so make those referral link up, uh, you know, with those partnerships in your communities, um, help those individuals with getting their basic needs met. Uh, you know, even children, when you're thinking about, you know, how they're impacted, uh, helping, uh, you know, them with getting just basic things like food and clothing can be so helpful. Uh, complete completing referrals, uh, you know, for any follow up care that's needed. And then again, just those recovery supports are so helpful for both the people in recovery and the families that are impacted. Um, some recovery groups that we just wanted to mention to you, uh, Al-Anon, of course, I think we had some individuals joining us today from Al-Anon uh, and uh, Naranon. They're both uh, great uh, support groups for families that are impacted by addiction. Uh, AANA is also a resource, uh, Celebrate Recovery. Uh, and then one thing we didn't mention on the slide that I'll add here is just uh, there is a codependency anonymous uh, support group as well called CODA. And so uh, if you are having some concerns or experiences around codependency, that's a great resource to be able to get some support there and most importantly link up with other individuals who are dealing with some of the same things. Next slide. And just taking care, uh, you know, of yourself. I think Krista mentioned that a few times. I did as well. Uh, you know, pr protecting your emotional health uh, and uh, you know, protecting your finances. Uh, one of the ways that you can really be helpful to your family member if they are in addiction is rather than giving them money directly, help them with getting the resources that they need. If it's food that they're needing, uh, you know, a ride somewhere, you know, those things are uh, a healthier option versus just handing someone who's an active addiction, you know, a bunch of money, expecting them to choose to use that effectively when those behaviors just don't always match up with somebody uh, when they're in active addiction. Uh, on your end also, uh, just protecting uh, your emotional health, uh, you know, counseling is such a great resource. Uh, if you've never done that before, uh, you know, it's nothing too heavy. Just think of it as a support system, uh, someone you can talk to about what you're dealing with who has expertise to help you figure out what resources you may be needing or your family may be needing. And then most importantly, uh, protecting your physical health. Um, be aware of your own substance use. Uh, we typically see quite, uh, you know, often it may be that family members start drinking more uh, when they're dealing with addiction in their family. It may be that they're, you know, spending every evening, oh, it's been so rough, I'm just going to have a couple of drinks. Uh, and a couple of drinks can turn into more and more. And so monitor your own, uh, you know, use of substances uh, and how you're using your time. Taking care of your health, making sure that you're eating, you're sleeping, uh, and you're not forgetting about you in the midst of everything you're helping your family deal with. Um, and uh, most importantly, the disease might hide the person underneath, but there's still a person in there who needs your love and attention. And just like we saw in some of those quotes, uh, let's never forget to think about those behaviors that go with addiction, uh, those things that are happening, uh, let's try to think about those as a behavior due to the addiction and not a reflection of that person. Um, helping them, you know, get the support that they need can help in eliminating those behaviors for sure. Next slide. Krista, I'll hand it off to you. Sure. Anything you, you want to share on there? Sure. Um... Well, you guys can read what the slide says. Um, I do need to change that. My oldest son is now 27. Um, many attempts at treatment. He started at age 18 um, with alcohol and then moved on to opiates and then eventually was IV fentanyl use. Uh, one thing that I do want to discuss is when your child is 18 to 21, they are, well, 18 and older, they are considered an adult. Uh, what a lot of parents don't realize is you cannot call anywhere. Um, you cannot make an appointment for that child. You cannot set anything up. So that was a huge uh, barrier for me because I, being in this field, 
my brain went to, I have connections. I can help him. I can fix him. I can do this. And you cannot call anywhere. Um, you cannot set up any appointments. So it did take him a good year. So I will say he is still young, thank God. Um, 19, he started treatment. Residential, made it eight, nine months out, and then unfortunately relapsed. So he has been to treatment five times. And right now, uh, through addressing his mental health, which hand in hand, mental health and the addiction, but finally addressing the mental health piece. Um, this month, he has two years of sobriety, continued sobriety. So um, the way that I, exactly as it says, um, I support, you know, I set up my healthy boundaries, support those in recovery. Um, and you have to know when it's time to let go. If you're not ready, I cannot keep hounding you to get ready. You know, just like the pre-contemplation and the contemplation. The person with the SUD has to be ready um, to go. You just have to keep gently maybe guiding them, them in that direction, but they have to know when they're ready. So to set up the healthy boundaries. Um, and then when they realize is, you know what, the consequences that you have are due to your choices. You know, don't ever blame the shame blame. No, you just have to be along for the ride with them. So that's my story. And there you go. Thank you um, for sharing that. You're welcome. Sure. Um, patient surveys. So out of 325 patients at Brightview, um, we asked them, uh, what keeps you in recovery? Number one, family. Uh, all the way from family, their goals that they set, the good sober community, having the accountability uh, in the sponsor, social media, oh, and a supportive app, which that is something real quick uh, for the parents, for the caregivers, for any family member, you know, that has a, a family member with the SUD. With social media and the apps now, you can find a support group online. Um, Facebook has a bunch. I'm on some of them. You can do them through Zoom. Uh, and then the app. There are apps for um, those in recovery as well. So it makes it a lot easier in today's world with those two things. Um, the next survey question was, what did your family and, our friends and or friends misunderstand most about the recovery? Uh, number one is how difficult it is. I call those in recovery warriors because it is a struggle day to day, no matter how long you've been sober. Um, how many of those factors can lead to addiction? Uh, why the med medically assisted treatment is important? And then how much are you changing to support your sobriety? Uh, next slide. And then patients again. Uh, most important thing to them is when you're listening to them, you're not judging them. You're giving them understanding and encouraging them, supporting without judgment, um, knowing that, you know, you only want the best for them, regardless of what they've done in the past. Um, what has been the most beneficial actions that were taken by your family or support system that helped you? Number one, making me accountable keeping track of where I'm at and what I'm doing, um, making sure you're not going around the same people, the same risky behaviors. Uh, is there anything you wish your family support system would have done differently? Showed me tough love. Wow, I wish they hadn't enabled me like they did. So there's that big enabling coming back. Um, most impactful words spoken by, by family members. Um, they believed in me. They know that I could do better for myself. Um, it meant a lot to them because didn't have a lot of people who did believe in them. Um, stop punishing myself. You deserve better. That was one question that we asked my son in the beginning. Why are you preventing yourself from having a good life? What is it that is holding you back from doing better? Um, and then simple as my daughter said, you know what, mom, I need you. 
I need you, so please get help. Next slide. Rhonda. Oh. Yeah, I think we're going to uh, jump into yeah. uh, questions at this point, but I uh, appreciate everybody for sticking up, sticking around. There's a lot to go around on this topic, and we're excited to, to be talking about this. Uh, one of the first questions is, should I give money to my son who is two months in recovery and in sober living? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, our recommendation really would be, uh, you know, rather than giving them money directly, would be to help them with getting the resources that they're needing. You know, whether that's hygiene supplies, uh, you know, snacks, um, you know, uh, a bus pass, whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, giving them the resource directly can usually be a better option. It can eliminate some of the potential just risk for misusing the money. Okay. That's great. And another um, individual is wondering if there's more assistance for fathers, you know, with the custody of their children and so forth. Um, so often that, that that's focused on for obvious reasons uh, with the um, spouse versus, uh, you know, the mother versus the father. So um, is there more assistance for them? Yes, there is. There is a national group. Um, you can look it up. Um, on online, it's called the Fatherhood Initiative. Uh, they have classes, there are resources there, uh, because a lot of fathers don't understand or, or aren't aware, I should say, that they can get services as well for their children. They can get, you know, the cash assistance if need be, the Medicaid, the food stamps, whatever they need uh, for their children as well. So, uh, Fatherhood Initiative, and it is um, worldwide. Excellent. Yeah, I just put the link to that actually in the chat. Fatherhood.org will take you there. Um, thank you. And how do I stop as a parent enabling my child without feeling guilty? So I think that guilt will always be there. I think it's just, at least for me, it, it always was. Um, and it goes back to taking care of yourself. Uh, you have to just realize, first of all, that you are enabling and in all reality, enabling, what are you doing for them? You know, you're not, you're not helping them. So, um, I, I really can't give you a good answer because I feel like there's always going to be guilt there to be honest with you as a parent, you know, no matter what your child's going through, it's how you're going to re react to that guilt and how you're going to handle that. Yeah, it sounds like that's a, that's a natural reaction to it, I suspect. Um, another question from one of our attendees, do you really recommend Al-Anon? Is there an approach that is less stigmatizing and less likely to aim for disconnection? I was putting a note in the chat about that. Uh, I've seen some people who've really found good support through Families Anonymous. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, in, some of the principles are still similar, but it does expand more to uh, addiction in general and other compulsive behaviors uh, that may occur with addiction. And uh, it also tends to focus more on, uh, you know, emotional support and things as well. So uh, that may be another option. And then I was going to put a few uh, in the chat just to answer that question. But one thing I just wanted to point out in regards to those support groups is it really can depend on that specific group that you attend. Um, uh, certainly, they're all based on some of the similar principles, but it can really be based on who's leading that group and who, uh, you know, who is uh, the person who's organizing that specific chapter or branch of that group. And so uh, we would we just encourage you uh, if you're looking for support, you know, as a family member, visit some of those groups, get a feel for what it's like, um, you know, and check out your options, right? You want to find one where you're in a room with people that you're comfortable with and, uh, you know, where you feel like you're getting the most support. So, uh, again, we'll put a few other options in the chat, but uh, Families Anonymous is another option uh, similar to Al Anon. That's a great point of clarification. I think you're right about the, you know, individual groups differing as well. Um, we have another attendee. We have time for one more here, and, and she's curious if you can provide a good reading or web resource to help educate children under 12 about uh, SUDs. Um, yeah, I think we can put something in the chat on that, and then Krista, go ahead if you have a specific name 
that you. Uh, I just was going to say SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, their website uh, has wonderful resources for speaking to uh, young children uh, regarding the SUD mental health as well. Um, I can put that, I mean, I can put it in the chat, the link for you as well. Okay, uh, we actually got a few more extra questions here, so I'm, I'm going to keep going. Appreciate everybody hanging out. Um, more than happy to answer these. Let's see. Do, 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 do you encourage Thrive peer support for addicts with or people with an SUD or a uh, alcohol use disorder? Did you oh. say it was Thrive? Is that what you used? Thrive, I can hear yes, you. Thrive peer support. Yeah, I think we would, uh, you know, I would say that would definitely could be a, an option for support. Uh, you know, one of the things I would just add is that uh, you never want to just depend on one thing or one person. And so I would say that's a part of your resource pool. Peer supports can be so helpful uh, because they've lived through that and have shared experiences that they can, uh, you know, share how they were able to use resources and supports to be able to help with their recovery. But uh, absolutely. That is a great question. Any tips for advising families when you are coming from a place of being another? I work for children's services and I get the impression that some families aren't willing to admit they need support as the family of an addict because they are afraid that might not place the kids with them. Exactly. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, they don't want them to go to foster care. So they want, yeah. Um, ooh. Uh, Um, I, I really hope that the families wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Um, are you saying that the families are afraid that they won't place the, you won't place the kid with them? Um, yeah, that's a great because, follow up question. Yeah, uh, because they're going to support. While we're seeing if Melissa is, is still on, can clarify that. Uh, the, I want to thank Chelsea for adding some links in here. From Sesame uh, Sesame Street, uh, they have uh, address a lot of tough topics. In fact, that's one of the URLs to their site that that can also prove helpful. Um, and I do think it's that's probably a resource we wouldn't normally think of, um, but is is definitely based and founded in a lot of credible sources and backgrounds. So uh, appreciate that. Um, let's see. Okay. Like, uh, as a kinship caregivers, they pretend that everything is fine. Well, I can obviously see that they're struggling with the emotional tool of having a loved one is struggling with an addiction. Okay. Okay. So that's going to go back to uh, offering them going to a group themselves, getting counseling for themselves. To, you know, realize ways they can help themselves as well as helping, you know, those whose child that they have. I think that's about self care and, you know, learning all that they can. I mean, they would, they, you know, know that the reason that they have the child is because of the substance use. Um, and I guess being there to support them, you know, you, there's no reason why. I'll, you can't, you know, we can't discuss this and reinforcing that you will probably, you know, be able to see the kids or maybe even be, the kids might be placed with you. That's great feedback. And I think with that, um, we are going to let you guys go. We've wrapped it up here.